Good afternoon. My name is Paul Ryer, and I am the Director of Scholar Programs here at the School for Advanced Research. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the first colloquium presentation of the 2021-2022 uh, academic year. Today's speaker, Dr. Chelsea West Ohori, is an assistant professor in the Department of Slavic and Eurasian Studies at the University of Texas, Austin. She is one of this year's uh, 2021 to 2022 Weatherhead Fellows here at SAR. Dr. West Ohori's research project while she is here is titled The Contours of Race Making in the Afterlife of Communism, an Ethnography of Belonging in Albania. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to her talk. Thank you, Paul. My name is Chelsea West Ohuri. I am an assistant professor of Slavic and Eurasian studies at the University of Texas at Austin. And I am very thrilled to be a residential fellow here at the School for Advanced Research. I want to start by thanking the School for Advanced Research and all the staff here who've been very wonderful. I'm so grateful for this opportunity to write on this beautiful campus. And I'm very excited to talk with you about my research today. I also want to begin by acknowledging my dad, who um, after my first summer to Albania, when I returned home, gave me a big hug and said, I'm so glad that you've gotten all this anthropology out of your system. And now you can focus on your other, uh, your other interests. And I had, uh, laughed to myself today, here I am now, almost 15 years later, uh, having completed my doctorate and my research, and now working on my book about Albania. And my dad did not live to see me complete that research, um, but I know that he uh, is very um, thrilled about uh, me presenting today. So the title of my talk today is The Contours of Race Making in the Afterlife of Communism, an Ethnography of Belonging in Albania. And I, um, that title is kind of a working title right now for, uh, for my book. Uh, but what I'm going to do today is kind of give you an introduction and overview about my research and then give an overview about the book itself and some of the major themes that I'll be addressing in it. And then we'll have some time, hopefully, for questions. So I want to begin by locating Albania. And so I have a map here um, that shows just a bit of the Balkan region and where Albania is. Albania highlighted here in orange. Uh, many people often think that Albania was a part of the former Yugoslavia, but it was not. It was surrounded though, right? It's surrounded by countries that were a part of the former Yugoslavia. Also borders Greece, and it's just across from the Adriatic from Italy here, as you can see. Albania is a, a relatively small country, population of about 3 million people. However, there's a large percentage of, I'm sorry, there's a large Albanian population that resides outside of the present day geopolitical Albanian nation state. So Kosovo is about 90% Albanian, Mas uh, Northern Macedonia, uh, so this map has Macedonia, but now Northern Macedonia um, is about uh, roughly 20% um, Albanian as well. And then there's large Albanian populations throughout Europe as well as in North America. In this picture here, I also, or this slide here, I have a picture of Enver Hoxha, uh, who was the communist dictator in Albania for much of the duration of the communist period between 1945 and 1991. I have a picture here just to provide some context about Albania as uh, a formerly communist state. And as you'll see too with my title and the framework I'm using in my book, I'm not using the framing of post-socialist or post-communist, but rather talking about the communist afterlife. And I will address that a bit more later on, but that's really key because I'm thinking not about an exact end to communism, right? So that the regime falls and that communism ends, nor do I wanna necessarily think about a transition uh, but rather thinking about what happens in the afterlife. What are the legacies of communism? What are the remnants? Uh, what lingers after the fall of the regime? And so that 
framing of the afterlife is one that I engage at, throughout the text and thinking of what the communist afterlife looks like in an Albanian context, as well as to getting at issues of things like trauma and how it's grappled with, uh, the ways that inequality emerges in the period post-1991 um, and, and the ways that people are making sense of the communist period and how that affects today. And so that's why that picture's there. And then this third picture, this third image, is of a ship that was uh, leaving southern Albania to head towards Italy shortly after the uh, communist regime fell. And so I wanted to give an idea here of the large number of people uh, that were boarding this uh, this boat, and, and there are several others like it. And to also contextualize for people who don't know, because at the time when people were leaving Albania and trying to resettle after 1991, it was the largest movement of people across Europe since the movements that occurred after World War II. So we're talking about a very very large number of Albanians getting out of Albania in this time. And it's also important to know too, you know, the Berlin Wall falls in 89 and then we see many, many communist states coming to an end in that period, um, in, in that time period from 1989 to 1991 across the Eastern Europe region. And while there are some similarities to some of the regimes and what happened and how they ended, Albania is particular. It is particular in its experience um, in the form of communism that exists there in terms of things around isolation and 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 Hoja's particular type of rule and style of rule and so those are some things I address in the book as well as how Albania was similar to other areas in the region but how it is also uh, very different I also here have another map so this map uh, kind of focuses more on Albania itself and gives a highlight of some cities. I have Tirana marked here, which is the capital city, and it's where I conducted a significant amount of research for this book. But I've also conducted research th throughout the country, and my first experiences doing ethnographic field work began in northern Albania in the high mountains. Both these pictures are from th that research time. I was first invited to participate in an ethno-archaeological project in northern Albania. Albania that was uh, led by uh, a few individuals, including my then professor, Dr. Mike Galati, uh, who's an archaeologist. And at the time, he invited me. I was an undergrad student. I had never traveled outside of the U.S. And I had expressed interest to my professors that I wanted to study abroad. I also had an older cousin who had really encouraged me to get outside of the United States, particularly to get out of the U.S. South. I'm originally from Mississippi, and she would often tell me how important it was to see other parts of the world. Now, I'm actually going to talk a bit about that towards the end when I talk about my own relationship to anthropology and field work and what it means to be an anthropologist uh, from the West, right, and doing this kind of field work um, and the kind of the long history of ethnographic field work in our, in our discipline of anthropology. But so to return to this, so these images are from 2006, my first summer there. I was a member of the survey archaeological team. As you'll see in this picture here where I'm wearing the yellow shirt, uh, I can't remember who took this picture, but uh, some, one of my uh, colleagues took it because I was trying to give an idea to my family of what survey archaeology looked like and what I looked like, you know, what I was doing every day. So my family wanted to know what's going on. Um, but what would often happen is that on a lot of these treks that we were making, sometimes because we were often in people's uh, property, we get permission to survey their land, and someone would find me after we had separated, right? Often it was maybe um, the Jushi, a uh, grand grandmother of the house, or uh, somebody who just kind of saw me and was wondering what I was doing, uh, why I was there. And I didn't speak Albanian at the time, but I did learn the words come, like haide, uh, as well as coffee, like cafe, and shtipi, house. Because very often people would just come take me and grab me by the arm and welcome me at their house. And uh, the leaders of our, of our survey team would find me later. I, again, I didn't speak Albanian, but people would be trying to talk to me, uh, trying to engage in conversation. Occasionally, there may be a family member who knew a few words in English to try to ask me some 
questions. Uh, but I later learned that most people were just very intrigued as to what I was doing there. Uh, most people in the village of Theft had never met a black person before. Uh, and I was also the only woman on our team that first summer. People had a lot of questions. I was the only woman on the archaeological team. People had a lot of questions. And uh, it was during that time that my professor said that I think you might want to consider more social cultural anthropology. And there was a social cultural anthropologist who was a part of the project. And she allowed me to uh, go on some interviews with her to learn more about the work she was doing. Uh, and then I was also invited to participate in the project the following summer and stayed in Albania a bit longer and conducted my own research uh, for my honors thesis as an undergraduate. And it was at that point I decided that I wanted to pursue more research in Albania, particularly around issues of identity. And that later really formed my early questions around race, right? And so not necessarily thinking, how do we apply American concepts of race to Albania, but rather, what can Albania tell us about racialization and how race operates at a global level? And it was those early encounters, particularly as I started learning more Albanian, those early encounters very much informed a lot of these initial questions about the racial encounter and what that can tell us about race making. So my research is ethnographic. The work that, uh, that I'm talking about today, the book that I'm talking about, is based on this ethnographic research, particularly since 2008. So I spent a year living in Albania in 2008, and now I've spent a total of 30 months over 15 years doing immersive field work. And so at times that's looked like a year, other times that's looked like maybe a month or two in the summer to do research. And this has included participant observation research, uh, field notes, uh, uh, in fact, this this image here is um, the background image is a, one of my field notebooks from Albania. Uh, I've done over a hundred structured and semi-structured interviews with interlocutors. I have detailed life histories with select families, families that I've spent time with, that I've lived with, that I've traveled with throughout Albania. I also conducted survey research in 2013 and 14, uh, and I'll be referencing some of that research a bit later. I've worked with research assistants to do that research as well as to do, uh, to do more archival research, and I myself have done archival research uh, in the National Archives. And here's some images, some pictures that I've just taken over the years. Um, I used to live not too far from this Starbucks coffee. Uh, there's no Starbucks in Albania. Um, but I used to um, live nearby. And, and, and also, too, uh, you know, Albania's coffee is way better than Starbucks anyways. But this Starbucks coffee, the guy who ran this um, cafe is really nice and sweet. And I would write there sometimes and attended a couple of events at, at the coffee shop. Um, and then I have some pictures here of my friends. Uh, across Albania, people that um, I have uh, have worked with, uh, particularly some folks here I've worked with uh, across the 15 years that I've been in Albania. I also have a picture from a protest where I participated with Roman and Egyptian families uh, in, in several protests during 2013 and 14 for better housing and to address uh, discrimination in areas around housing and jobs and health. And then I also have a picture here of Inver Hoja's grave site, uh, which is covered in plastic flowers. And I address, as well in my book, how people you know, remember that communist period, and then um, how do those memories, as well as the sentiments, the cultural forms that uh, reflect that time period, how do they emerge today? And so I wanted to provide some images just um, to kind of orient you all. So how is all this connected to race and racial belonging? I have here some terminology that I've broken down to thinking about race, racialization, and racial belonging. I'm not going to read everything here. But what's really key to know is that race is a social political construct, but it poses as biological. So maybe you've heard that race is not biological. It's a social construct, right? But it still poses as biological. Um, it's about hierarchy. It's about power. It is unstable, always in process. And as, as Stuart Hall noted, you know, it's the floating signifier, right? So um, you know, what race ends up signifying, what race you know, denotes, um, it, it, it always is changing, right? It's always in process. Um, racial 
institutionalization is what I'm really getting at in this book is how race operates. How is it practiced? How do we know how racial identities are marked or not? How they've been constructed over time and space? And then you know, the attribution of racial meaning, right? What does race even mean? And what does it mean in a particular local and historical context? And so I've used this understanding of racialization and then belonging in terms of a social attachment of a particular type of attunement, right? Um, feelings around inclusion, exclusion, and marginality to really think through what racial belonging is, how it involves emotional investment, um, exploring what it means to feel white or to feel black or to feel othered. That's what I'm getting at a lot in this book. And so how do we engage race in the Balkans when there's assumed racelessness, right? Particularly in the context of post-World War II, right? And the ways that um, you know, Europe has often thought of itself as you know, you know, it, devoid of race, right? That there is no race. Um, and if you think about example of a country like France, right? That doesn't keep any data or any kind of, um, any kind of markings or, or in terms of like state data or like if you were to fill out a form, for example, right? About, about race, right? There's no, um, there's no kind of uh, collection ar around race in, in that kind of formal way, right? In the same way, you know, it would be wrong to assume that the, what we do in the United States, right? In terms of filling out forms, when we have to talk about racial identity, when we fill out the census, for example, um, if you're making a doctor's appointment, right, that's, that also doesn't exist in that same way in Albania, right? So again, this is not a project that is taking American constructs or South African constructs, right, and thinking about apartheid and thinking about, oh, what does that look like in Albania? But again, what does Albania tell us about race? And so it's important, too, I mentioned South Africa, and I also think about um, Nazi Germany, right, because very often people will say, okay, yeah, race and those context, race in the American context, for example, or the Americas, right? Yes, perhaps. But uh, people often think of the Balkans in a, in a um, you know, racelessness, right? A space of racelessness. Um, and also, too, because so often the Balkans is talked about in terms of ethnic conflict, especially after the breakup of the former Yugoslavia, uh, particularly thinking about uh, what, you know, people frame ethnic ancient hatreds, right? And so I talk about this in the book, and I'll address it some a bit today, right, but that in fact, race and ethnicity, as Stuart Hall notes, play hide and seek with one another, right? Oftentimes, when people are talking about ethnicity, they're talking about race and vice versa. And so people often ask me too, well, why not ethnicity? And I often respond, well, both, right? Because even though ethnicity is thought to be something very separate from race, and there is there are some distinctions, right, between what's, uh, what's an ascribed identity, right, versus what's an, a self-ascribed identity or multiple identities versus what's considered to be assigned, right? Um, in terms of um, ethnicity, often thought of as not hierarchical and race as such. So people, you know, sociologists especially, have made these distinctions. But as Michael Stewart notes, uh, especially when we're thinking about uh, different groups, socio-racial groups, in Europe, there's a way, too, that ethnicity itself is racialized, right? Especially when we're talking, too, about the ways that people assign racial categories. And so what I also am arguing in this book is that though the Balkans is thought of as a space of racelessness, in fact, it's shaped by these global, uh, these global processes of racialization uh, just as other other regions are. And so I have a couple of quotes here that I want to share with you all to kind of think, think through some of the things that I just talked about. So here's one from David Theo Goldberg who says, quote, Europe begins to exemplify what happens when no category is available to name a set of experiences that are linked in their production or at least inflection historically and symbolically, experientially and politically to racial arrangements and engagements. Gloria, Gloria Vecker, who's done a lot of work about race in the Netherlands, says that there's a silent ordering of people, right? So even when race is not acknowledged, uh, it, that there is a silent racial ordering that's happening, and it's shaping everyday life. It's shaping our sociopolitical landscapes, even if it's not acknowledged. <laughs> 
Cedric Robinson once wrote, quote, racism was not simply a convention for ordering the relations of European to non-European peoples, but has its genesis in the internal relations of European people, end quote. And this is really key for my project because again, race is often seen as outside of Europe. And so not only is it not outside of Europe, but Europe is the birthplace and that kind of racial ordering began with the internal racial ordering that Robinson talks about here. And so that's very important for the project and what Albania can tell us, right, in the ways that Albanians have been racialized outside of, of, a, of a type of whiteness, right, a type of European whiteness. And we must remember, too, that Europe is the birthplace for a lot of these racial ideas that, that came to be, especially during, um, you know, in they came to be during modernity, right? So we're talking about these, uh, you know, these, um, Re these people who were conducting their own type of research, and I use that word very loosely, right, but to try to create a, a racial hierarchy, right, in which whiteness was at the top and blackness was at the bottom. That race itself was about a ranking and ordering in terms of of, of the most humanized, the most civilized. And, and so what Robinson is really getting at here is that this didn't begin just with the colonial encounter, right, in which Europeans encountered people not like them and began ranking, but it also, but ra rather it really began with the internal other, right? And, and in many ways, the Balkans occupies that space. And so in my book, I engage notions, you know, around Orientalism, Saeed's notion of Orientalism, um, as well as thinking about um, Bakich Hayden's nesting Orientalisms, right? And then Todorova's concept of Balkanism. But what I'm also doing, like other scholars uh, have recently begun to do in the Balkan region, is to situate race within this conversation, right? Because some of those frameworks, too, are often employed by scholars still with this idea of a racelessness. And what I'm trying to argue is that, in fact, we need to address racialization and that Albania, as as part of an ethnogra ethnographic exploration or an ethnographic analysis can tell us quite a bit about how race and racialization work in Europe as well as, uh, as, well as broadly globally. I have another quote here to share from uh, Nikolay Zakharov and Ian Law, who are two scholars who've written quite a bit about race in um, post-socialist and post-Soviet contexts. And they write, quote, the scholar of race needs to address the question of why people employ certain categories, race, blackness, whiteness, under which historical situations these categories are relevant, and under which institutional circumstances, ideas of race generate social effects. End quote. And so this quote is also very helpful too for thinking about why this kind of terminology gets and gets used and how it gets used. And that's something I talk about in the book and I will expand upon a bit later, especially thinking about words like race, whiteness, and blackness and how they are used in the Albanian context. Okay, so that leads me to our next slide, right? So race and racialization in the Albanian context. So uh, one thing I'm getting at in this book is what are the meanings of the word rasa, right, race? Um, and how does the term get used? Um, understanding uses of terms ebarth and ezez, right? Ebarth meaning white, ezez meaning black. And, and how do those terms get used uh, linguistically, you know, socially? Uh, what are the ways that people are, are employing these terms in their everyday lives? And how do they get used? to mark people, for example. Uh, the communist afterlife is very important, but also the Ottoman afterlife. So really historically situating this text, not just, you know, post-1945, but really in the Albanian, in the Ottoman uh, context as well. Now, I'm not an Ottoman uh, scholar, nor am I a historian. And so when I say contextualize, I'm talking about the ways that in the book, I, I, I frame what we're talking about in the present day and the ethnography that I have conducted, the ethnographic research that I've conducted and framing that historically. And so it's important to think about those contexts, especially too, because when we're talking about uh, racial belonging and difference and othering, well, the Ottoman context is extremely important for thinking about not just Albania, but the Balkans as a region, right? Uh, as well as intersections of race, class, gender, and religion, also as shaped by the communist period as well as the Ottoman period, right? And so those intersections are very important uh, in thinking about Albania, which 
if we're talking about in terms of religion, a, a significant majority of Albanians identify as Muslim. However, many of those two, I, I, Albanians in Albania, right, because I also don't want to make the distinction between Albanians in other Balkan countries, but Albanians in Albania who, um, who identify as Muslim, a significant uh, number of them are also um, secular Muslims. And Albania uh, was, was the only country, or I think, and maybe to this day too, has still been the only country to ever officially declare itself as atheist. And that happened under the Hoxha regime. It doesn't mean that religion was done away with completely. And there are a couple of texts that address the ways that religion was practiced uh, during that time period still. But that's important to know, too, how that shapes the landscape today and the ways that Albanians are racialized and how that is shaped, too, by, um, by Muslim and global understandings of what it means to be Muslim and thinking about what Junaid Rana talks about in terms of the racialization of Muslims themselves. Themselves, right, so that's also key. Those intersections are very key. Also, it's important because in Albania, there's a, like I said, a significant Muslim population, but you have about 30% of the population that identifies either as Orthodox or Catholic. And so Albanians too have a particular relationship to religion and religious uh, tolerance, and that comes up in the book as well because some people are, you know, some of my interlocutors talk with me about how they've never thought about Albania as a place that could be racist because of the uh, levels of religious tolerance, the high levels, especially relative to other Balkan countries. And so what I often, you know, introduce, you know, begin with that this is not a project to mark Albanians as racist or to talk about how racist are people, but rather it is a project that takes racial belonging as its ethnographic object. And I'm really tracing race. I'm really looking at how racialization operates. However, that does also speak to, though, meanings of racism, right, and what it means to be racist, and particularly how Albanians might talk about ra like who is racist or what racism means to them, how Roma, how Egyptians might talk about that. And so that's all addressed in the book. And that gets me to the next point, too, about racialization in terms of group dynamics, right? So race and how the, and how groups interact, but then also race structurally and how uh, structural inequality is shaped by racialization. And so this is key because this is not, while the book does get a lot at relationships between Albania, Albanians, Roma, Egyptians, for example, in Tirana, it's also not just about how uh, groups might have a certain type of prejudice, for example, or how groups might feel othered, but then how that also shapes the everyday life, how it shapes access to resources, to power, um, how hierarchies are shaped that then, um, that then kind of are reproduced throughout Albania as well as reproduced throughout Europe. And so it's important to understand that when I'm talking about racialization, I'm speaking to it on those multiple levels. Here's an example of, uh, uh, so I've done a visual example of survey responses to one of my questions that I asked about racism, that I asked about race. And so in the survey, I asked uh, two questions about how people understand what race is, and then how people would describe, you know, what racism is, like, and, and then I took the data from that survey and put it together in terms of word frequency and then produced this visual uh, visualization for you all today. And so you'll see right there in the middle is Grechi. Now I know a lot of you may not speak Albanian, so I'm gonna tell you what some of these words mean. But Grechi uh, is uh, referring to Greece, right? And so uh, one thing I get at in the book too is the relationship between Albania and Greece, and ha so many Albanians who understand the uh, interactions between Albanians and Greeks to be the, uh, those that have been more racist to them than any other encounters they've had. I talk about that border between Albania and Greece and the history of that border. I also talk about um, a group of Albanian return migrants who had all really spent their formative years in Greece and then returned to Albania after the 2008 2009 economic crisis in Greece and talk about their experiences being Albanian growing up in Greece. And so this word appears here kind of front and center. And I also use a part of this section of a chapter to talk about how Albanians understand what race is, right? So to go back to that local context, because even though Albanians and Greeks potentially could be racialized in this 
broader understanding of whiteness. In fact, many Albanians who responded to the survey, almost a quarter, saw Albanians and Greeks um, as, uh, as, as separate races. Now, my survey was not uh, ref is not representative of the entire population, so I don't want to say many Albanians think this or and generalize and say that. But I will say of my survey respondents, which targeted a particular age range, mostly um, younger adults, m a significant number of them really grappled with this question around race and who is included in a race. And so what does it mean to be of the Albanian race? And that's all really key and important because it helps us understand, again, how race operates and how people understand what race is. And so I won't go over every term here, but what also is important here is to note that immigrant, right, immigrant is also right next to, uh, in terms of size, near Greci, as well as discriminim, as well as words though like um, shiptar, which is a derogatory term. Um, so it, it's a way that non-Albanians might use to ridicule Albanians. And so um, the way to say, uh, to write Albanian, an Albanian person in the Albanian language is S-H-Q-I-P-T-A-R. Um, but what people will do is to write it with uh, um, an SH without the Q and then have a hard sound on that SH and, 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 and then also mispronounce the I. So it becomes like a shiptar instead of sheepdar, which is how you would say it in Albanian. And so many people talked about what it has been like to experience being called um, that term. Um, other words here though, um, embropsht means backwards, like backwardness, right? Um, you know, words, like Europe is there. Um, as well as um, dreitat, which is rights, so thinking about human rights, uh, different forms of like discrimination, different words there. Uh, Serbia and Italy are also there, right? So that's Serbia and Italy. And so thinking again about the ways that many people understand racism in terms of the immigrant experience. And so I talk about that in the book, uh, as well as that many Albanians see themselves as the victim of racism, both from you know those in neighboring countries, uh, as well as those in other countries though, like the racism they feel that they have experienced Experienced. But at the same time, what many Roma and Egyptians talk about the uh, everyday racism that they experience in Albania. And, and so what we really have is a, a perplexed kind of idea here where we're talking about how people in, in the Albanian context maybe get racialized outside of whiteness, right? Outside of a Europeanness, but then also are racialized as white and then have particular type of racist encounters or interactions with Roma Egyptians and how they then are also racialized as black. So that's what I'm also so that's one of the key components of the book. So speaking of the book and its major themes, again, we've talked a bit about the communist afterlife, providing a historical framework. Uh, and then in a section where I talk about this, I use five ethnographic stories um, to talk about in, uh, inequality and racial belonging and how they emerge in the communist afterlife to uh, set the book. And then I have a section on engaging whiteness. And I'm going to read now uh, just a, 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 a one ethnographic story that gets at but both what I see is the, in terms of the communist afterlife and these questions around whiteness. Um, I should also say too, so this chapter is really historicizing whiteness in Albania and the Balkan region, the shifting meanings of whiteness and the notion of not quite white, so I was just talking about there, uh, what it means to feel white or to, to make claims to whiteness and to simultaneously make claims to whiteness and blackness, right? Which happens a lot in the Albanian context. And then whiteness and the boundaries of European belonging. So this first ex uh, ethnographic story I'm gonna read gets uh, um, somewhat to that. Uh, historian Isa Blumi once talked about how Albanians grapple with a certain type of anxiety as it relates to our, their identification as Europeans. And uh, recently, anthropologist Smokey Musarai has often talked about something similar about the self identification as Europeans, uh, but how that is a very anxious one. <coughs> Excuse me. The following is an ethnographic example that tries to illustrate this. Some might think of it as a task that would take 10 to 15 minutes, maybe 20, if the person on the other end of the phone were slow. Bona and Quitim, a married couple, have recently returned to Tirana after living in New Jersey for several years. They tried their hand at living in the States and found that in their older age, they are more comfortable living in Albania. Their current bank cards have expired and they need to make a call to the American bank so that the updated cards can be sent to their new address in Albania. 
Bona is especially anxious about this task. She and Quatim do not feel confident in their abilities to carry it out. She had previously tried to call, and it caused such a headache that she feared trying again on her own. As such, they have organized a coffee with two younger neighbors, both of which are more familiar with technology, in hopes that they could help them with the dilemma. At the coffee shop, Bona learns that the listed phone number on the back of the card is a 1-800 number, but she's unable to make a 1-800 call to the U.S. with her standard Albanian cell phone. The bank offers no international code for Albania, only nearby European countries such as Italy and Greece. Bona and Quatim nod their heads in unison. It is because we're not really in Europe, she says. We are a bit behind, Quatim adds. After one of the neighbors does some online searching, they are eventually able to locate a private number for the bank, but when Bona tries to dial it, her cell phone does not work properly. She keeps reaching an operator who informs her that her, her phone call cannot be placed. If we were in Europe, this would not be a problem, she further laments, as they wait to speak with a phone company employee about their phone. So at this point, they're calling an Albanian company about their phone. Temporary success. Under the phone settings, international calling had been disabled. So now the phone operator has explained how to enable international dialing. And, it informs Bo and they inform Bona and Quitim how to make the call. They will, however, need a PIN code. Bona says she does not have a PIN. She sighs. The neighbor has some prepaid minutes on her phone and offers to make the call to the states. Bona and Quitim initially object, but they give in and make the call. English, Albanian, English, Albanian again. Bona seems overwhelmed. The bank, it turns out, will not send the cards to their Albanian address and will only send them to the address on file. A relative or someone in the States will have to go to their New Jersey apartment, retrieve the cards, and mail them to Albania. Bona and Quatim are disappointed with this outcome. Well, we tried to do it. If only we were not in Albania and we were in Europe, Bona muses. So this ethnographic example gets at some of these issues that I was talking about around whiteness, particularly engaging that type of anxiety or that angst. The next section that I'm going to talk about is a, a part of my book that really gets at the ways that Roma and Egyptians are racialized as black. And so what meanings does blackness carry in the Albanian context? Who articulates blackness and what type of blackness are they articula articulating and why? How does racialization shape access to housing, jobs, and resources? Uh, what can we learn about engaging anti-Ziganism and Romophobia in this context? Um, and, and, and further, too, how that relates to anti-blackness globally. Uh, and then what, a ra what does racial inequality look like in local and global context? This next ethnographic story uh, is about an Egyptian political party. I should also note that when I use the word Egyptian, I'm not talking about people uh, who are um, present day like present day nation state of Egypt, so you know, Egyptian nationals living in Albania, but rather a group of people who are often uh, considered to be Roma, but in fact trace their heritage and their identity through Egypt. Uh, and so in the book, I also talk about, uh, the, about Egyptians and Roma and how they see themselves as distinct groups, but are both racialized as black and how there's a lot of overlap too in those processes. So this next section is about the Egyptian political party that was forming in the early um, 2010s. All the political parties eat our money, Han Leckett. That's how I would say eat money. The white Albanians have political parties. They organize better than us. Romes and Egyptians, we only have shochat, NGOs. This is why we're forming a political force, a political party that will speak for the Egyptians, Roma, and all blacks in Albania. I listen as Aleman describes an emerging political party and the upcoming meeting that they want me to attend. We are forming our own party, Spresa adds. We are tired of white people speaking for us. Though the group represents the interest of Egyptians, Rome, and those marked as black in Albania, Aleman says that the group is comprised mostly of Egyptian activists who want to fight discrimination in the country. The leader of the party says he believes there are close to 300,000 Egyptians in Albania. The first meeting that I attend takes place in the Kino Studio neighborhood, an area affectionately regarded as the heart of Tirana. We all gather in a, in a courtyard behind one of the members' homes, and I learned that this is only the third or fourth general body meeting. About 15 to 20 people are in attendance, mostly middle-aged older men. After introductory remarks, the floor is open for general commentary. 
You leaders are doing heroic work that is previously unseen in Albania, someone yells from the back. A round of applause follows. Some of those attending for the first time introduce themselves. I hear comments such as, no one realizes how big and poor we black people are in Albania, and politicians want to smile with black people for an opportunity, for an EU photo opportunity, or for political, political gain, but the next day they do not know you, they do not speak to you. A younger member of the party speaks up. I visited one of our neighborhoods a couple of days ago and you would not believe the things I saw. People with major health problems, kids who are blind, no nutrition, people without homes, older women sick and begging on the streets, and young boys accused of crimes all because they are Egyptian. We have to make a party that will speak for us. These politicians do not care about us. We have to do it ourselves. The meeting concludes after about an hour and people chat with one another before parting ways. An older gray-haired gentleman in a brown sweater wants to know why I'm attending the meeting. I explain my research and he replies, you all in America need to light a candle day and night for Martin Luther King Jr. That is the kind of movement we want here in Albania. Another section of the book is getting at this notion of uh, racial misunderstandings and racial intimacies. So in this chapter, I'm getting at two of the ways that race is itself misunderstood, right? But particularly thinking about racism, because that conversation does come up quite a bit, right? And so the, uh, how different practices as they relate to humor or looking at local sport and media representations and how uh, you know, th there's these uh, encounters between people and and then uh, there's often an assertion that people misunderstand, that there are racial misunderstandings, um, that there is humor at play, and so it's not really something that's racist. And in this chapter, I'm engaging the Albanian local context, but also the broader European context, right? Looking at the ways that frameworks of hooliganism, as it relates to sport, for example, are often thought of as separate than racism. I also analyze uh, some Albanian football matches, including one with Serbia, um, that took place about five or six years ago now, um, in which ended in a, in a fight, in, a, in an actual brawl, and, and the ways that that particular incident was talked about and was talked about in the media in terms of race and racial representation. And once again, I'm situating Albania here in this broader European and even global context to see what we're able to learn about race and how race operates in these, in these multiple settings. So as I conclude, I want to note that this book is about Albania, but it's also about anthropology and how anthropology as a field has engaged race. And in doing so, I'm thinking about myself, my position as the ethnographer, as a black woman conducting this research, and so also asking in the book, what does it mean to ethnographically examine racial logics and how they operate, and include my own encounters as a black woman doing this work? Uh, what does a black feminist um, anthropological engagement look like in a Balkan context. And so I also share my experiences, it's titled The Anthropologist Takes a Stand, for two reasons, because I, I literally was on a television show, a national Albanian television show, in the fall of 2013, in which I talked about my research, but also um, was really pressed about whether I thought Albanians were racist or not, which was again, not the focus of my research, it's not now, but uh, what, what emerged was a very intense conversation around race and racism. And so I talk about that experience, um, as well as thinking about what it means as an anthropologist, uh, the legacy of anthropology as a discipline, anthropology's own relationship to race, to notions of the other, and how anthropologists particularly have framed foreignness and otherness, and so really grappling with that in this chapter uh, as well. Thank you for your time. Wow. Well, Chelsea, thank you so much that there are so many questions here. Um, just for people who are joining us late, uh, again, I am Paul Ryer, the Director of Scholar Programs at SAR, and also a cultural anthropologist. And uh, Dr. Westohori here is, is our presenter and a fellow this year at the School for Advanced Research. Um, before we start uh, a conversation, I see that there are a few questions in the Q&A. Please, if you have questions and you're watching, uh, please feel free to add some questions. Uh, we only have a few here. 
and hopefully we'll have time to get to all of them. If we do get a lot of questions, we may want to condense ones that overlap. Um, and Chelsea, you and I can take turns looking at those questions. Uh, maybe I could start with one. Um, as you know, but perhaps our audience does not know, I'm an ethnographer of contemporary Cuba. And um, like you, I experienced a Cuban, under Cuban understandings of race in a lived way for several years living there. And I've written about that as well. And those understandings in some regards seem to overlap with North American ones, but in very very distinct ways they don't. And it's also a, uh, I, I love your phrase, the communist afterlife. I would say in Cuba, since it's not at all post-socialist, still a socialist government, um, I, I always shy away from the term post-socialist as well. It doesn't work there, but um, it is a socialist context or a communist afterlife context in, in Cuba as well. And so the comparative questions in my head are just bouncing around. Um, my, my first question is a hard one, but it kept, it kept recurring to me during your talk, and that is, I wonder what you could say or reflect on the relationship that, you, as you experienced it in Albania, uh, and as you experienced it ethnographically, uh, between race and class. Um, I, for me, that was always really complex in Cuba. It was complex because under socialist ideology, there was no class. And so Cubans really didn't talk about class and had a hard time articulating it uh, because in fact, in formal Marxist terms, everybody pretty much shared the same relation to the means of production. The state in Cuba today still owns 80% of most of the factories, all the hotels, bus stations, blah, blah, blah. And theoretically holds that in common for all the citizenry. But that became, uh, it, was, it was so hard to talk about class, but, it, but it, at the same time, class dynamics were happening. There were all kinds of class dynamics happening in the 21st century in Cuba are happening with remittance economy emerging certain Cubans, had access to remittance dollars and others didn't. So there, there were all kinds of sort of class formation moments going on that people couldn't talk about. I wonder if what, what your experience in Albania with class is and race. Thank you, Paul. That is an excellent question. And so to that, I actually um, have a couple things. Um, so yes, in thinking about the communist period, and um, you know the attempt, right, to eradicate class differences. Um, what you still found, though, was that um, families, in particular, were still treated uh, differently. Not and so, in some ways, those families who owned um, a lot of property or who had um, had different types of wealth before the communist regime began were targeted. Um, they, you know, their property was uh, taken away by the state and um, divided in particular ways. Um, uh, you know, we already know too that members of the elite and the um, educated classes were often the first to be sent to inter uh, the internment camps. Um, and so, um, and also too, there was a lot of, um, of assignments around, um, around residents, around places where people live that the Hoxha regime uh, re redesigned in, in an effort, um, in its own effort to uh, establish its own type of uh, social order. And so that's really key because there were still differences between families um, you also had then those two who are marked as enemies um, of the communist state, right? Um, they they were uh, ostracized and treated differently. And so you still had class in a way, but not necessarily in the same economic terms, right? Um, also, but, but yes, many people talk about how uh, their families were all equally impacted by the regime. Um, car owners, personal car ownership was not allowed by anyone outside of select uh, party members. Uh, and then as some people would say in my interviews, they might say, oh, well, you know, we were all poor. We all had to wait in the same bread line. We all had to wait in the same milk line. Uh, and so um, for some people, there is a sense that there was a type um, of, of equality in that way because everybody was equally impacted. I often hear too from Roma and Egyptians 
opinions about the policies in place under the regime that they felt uh, per- secured housing, for example, right? That maybe they didn't have the same type of housing as everyone else, but they did have um, access to housing. I want to briefly stop and just say that my five-year-old daughter is here and um, just you know, in this world of pandemic life and Zoom, I just wanted to acknowledge that in case you all hear her. Um, but um, to get back to that point, many Roman Egyptians in interviews might talk about um, about the uh, communist period in terms of some things that they found more favorable, especially uh, compared to what has happened post-1991 and particularly post-2000, in which you have many Roman Egyptian families either um, living in a type of um, of temporary housing, like a shack or a shanty, um, or in these temporary relocation zones, but they're uh, indeterminately suspended there. So the municipality has tried to address the housing issues and the housing inequality, and yet there is not a, a, a great or significant effort to address that uh, systematically throughout the country. And this is a particularly acute problem in Tirana, where you have much more economic um, inequality than we saw in the period before, uh, before the, um, in the communist period. I also want to add uh, that when you, um, so, so I talked about the section of my book of racial intimacies, for example, and in Tirana, when you have neighborhoods where many Roma uh, or Egyptians might reside, they're often next to neighbors who are from the north. And so this regional difference is also very important in Albania um, because uh, historically there has been uh, ideas about people from the south, uh, you know, being, uh, having a different type of social um, a different type of social ranking, so to speak, as, and um, a, a, a ways that people from the north have been um, othered within Albania. And so this is also key uh, because one of the areas where I did a lot of research, the area of Shkos, which is right outside of Tirana, has a lot of people who are from the north who've come to Tirana um, since the end of communism to re- reestablish their families there. Uh, and so um, you will also have people who will talk about that area of goes uh, and, and really other it as though they are backwards in general. So including Roma and Egyptians and those Albanians from the north. Uh, you also will see people, so a term um, like Malok, which means uh, refers to a northern person, a, a, a highlander, a mountain person um, in Albanian, which can be a term that's used in pejorative context. You'll see people, you'll see Roma and Egyptians affectionately use that word and then um, some of the people who are labeled as my look will then use a term like um, uh, two other pejorative terms in the Albanian language, gabel or uh, yev, uh, which again are, could be read as very, um, very pejorative, but are used in a very intimate, affectionate way. And, and, and part of that too, I think class plays a big role in shaping those interactions, um, as well as um, this kind of class regional difference that exists throughout Albania. I know that was a long answer. No, it's great. It's great. I, yeah, I mean, it, it, the Cuban state generally refu- does what you described some European states doing. They, they say, we're not going to measure people or classify them by race. We're going, to, we're going to solve the class problem, and race is simply an epiphenomenon of class. That's the Marxist ideology that they've operated under. And I think a lot of uh, Cubans find that that's, that kind of silences their ability to articulate some problems that they experience as being racialized. And so it's a, it's a, it's a weird kind of silencing in the name of e- egalitarianism. And it, I think what you've described is, sounds a little bit like a comparable history. I, I, you and I can talk forever. I, I would really love that. And I'm looking forward to more interaction uh, this year. But I think we should look, we do have questions. Let's see. Um, do you want me to take the first, read the first one out here? You, uh, it's, it's for you. <laughs> the very first question I see here. Um, well, firstly, a couple of comments. Lori, thank you for the comment about the communist afterlife as beautifully articulated. I totally, absolutely agree. Um, but then there's a question, anonymous question for you, Chelsea. Um, do you want me to read it? You want to read it? I'll, 
How are you as a black feminist American anthropologist received by the Albanians? <laughs> That's a question on a lot of people's mind, I'm sure. <laughs> I laugh because I get asked that question uh, a lot. Uh, and so this also was asked uh, on that television show uh, when I was a guest on Wake Up Tirana in the fall of 2013. And in fact, many of the producers and the host were very concerned about my well-being. Um, and so when my friend who recommended me for the show said I wanted to talk about racial belonging as a Black woman, um, the, many people were either defensive about Albanians, but even more so than that, saying, well, who's being racist to you? Um, give me their names, right? So uh, they wanted to know in particular um, you know, who, they, who I thought was being racist. And a lot of that is shaped, too, about how Albania how Albanians uh, regard um, what it means to welcome guests, what it means to be um, hospitable. And so I do get at this in, um, in a chapter in my book, in chapter two, where I'm talking about my methodology and my positionality, but also this uh, relationship between hospitality and welcoming the guest. And then the notion of shame that many people feel if I begin to talk about racialization because people feel very ashamed about how about how I've been treated. And even though this that's not the focus of the book, that is a major concern for a lot of people. Um, so I, I and I, I should say that you know Albania um, you know, obviously holds a very particular place, um, in, not just in my research, but for me personally, um, I have established um, a very large social network there. Um, I have very close friends um, and, and, and members of my family have traveled to Albania as well. And so we've been received very well. Um, I also too sometimes tell a story about how I had found my way to uh, a small village, uh, or, or sorry, or sorry, a small city in Northern Albania. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with Albania, you know it's uh, Tripoya. I found my way there um, on a journey. I was trying to get to Kosovo and I won't give the entire backstory, but by the time I got to Tripoya, after going across um, by Armsuri. Again, for those of you unfamiliar, you're not going to know this. But the point is, I got to Tripoya and there were no buses to take me on to Kosovo, even though I had been told that there would be buses. And um, believe it or not, uh, a, a person I'd never met, an Albanian guy, heard me talking at the cafe. And so he gave me a ride to the border. Um, and then I was stuck at the border for about three hours because there were no cars going across the border between Albania and Kosovo. Um, and the cafe owner was very nice to me. There was one cafe at this border point and he kept serving me coffee and trying to talk to me but he was also getting very concerned because I was stuck there and lo and behold then a car showed up with three gentlemen and um the the guy who owned the previous cafe where I was stranded told his nephew when his nephew got off work to come pick me up at the border and to take me to Kosovo um, and that's how much hospitality people were showing me and I share that story not to you know kind of freak out my family about um, some of the things that I've done in Albania but really to show like the levels of hospitality and the the links that people would go to to make sure I felt welcome to make sure I was taken care of um, and I have other examples like that and so I want to just kind of reiterate what that has been like alongside the ways though that I have been racialized, that I have experienced racism at multiple levels, the ways that people talk to me about blackness and um, in a very forward way that I'm not accustomed to, the ways I've been called the N word um, and people maybe don't mean, they, they might say, oh, I didn't mean anything bad about it. Uh, the ways that people have been shocked to even see me, to touch my hair, uh, to rub my skin, to see if the color comes off, right? So I've had these very, um, these very strange encounters, right? That I try to work through like what that looks like, as well as being very well received. Uh, people are showing a lot of interest in my work and, and welcomed into people's lives. Uh, I wanna also add to, to end this, uh, too, is that you know anthropology can be very invasive, right? So that an ethnographer would uh, show up somewhere uh, and say, I'm going to do research here and I would like to be involved in your lives in intimate ways. And so I do talk about that in that, in that chapter I mentioned about my own position as an ethnographer, my relationship to the field of anthropology um, and what that looks like in terms of how I'm received in Albania, uh, which to this day, some of my friends still ask me if I'm a spy because they, they still question like, what exactly am I doing? <laughs> I get that all the time in Cuba. You, you, this is a beautiful articulation of the agony and ecstasy of, of the ethnographic experience, that there are beautiful and painful things kind of in, intermixed. And that, that was beautifully put. 
Um, let me ask the next question um, I see here. Um, well, we have another comment. I think that your understanding of racial belonging is key, and I don't remember any other scholar addressing this issue regarding Albania in such nuance. That's a comment. Um, here's a question. Is there an agreed upon racial hierarchy or does it depend on who is looking or speaking? So I want to say thank you for those comments. I appreciate them. And thank you for this question. All the questions have been really great. Uh, thank you all. Uh, and so I, um, I actually have a few notes here. I was taking some notes while watching a talk and things I wanted to talk about. And so uh, in terms of racial hierarchy, so if we think back to, uh, to thinker, uh, to, uh, people, uh, scientists, and I again use that term uh, loosely, you know, some people might say pseudoscientists, we think about people like uh, Blumenbach, uh, Johann Blumenbach and Carl Linnaeus and other uh, German, German um, scientists who were writing in the 17th and 18th century and trying to create these, what they thought of as like these human taxonomies, right? Trying to rank people uh, mm -hmm. and along lines of development and civilization. These were uh, the hierarchy that existed was one that positioned white people at the top and black people at the bottom. And then there were these murky middle categories um, that uh, today, in today's terminology would be used to say things like, uh, would be grouped in terms of like Asians uh, or, um, or maybe American in terms of indigenous folks, um, kind of ranked in the middle between whiteness and blackness. But what's really important is that white and black were constructed against one another and that white people were considered to be the most civilized, the most um, the most developed, right? White society is the most developed. And then those that are, are, were, racial, were racialized as black um, considered to be at the bottom, those the, the most non-human, right? That was really what the what these type of systems were. And so when we have more of the colonial encounters as we have, um, you know, um, as, there, as there's colonialism in various parts of the world, there's not necessarily one agreed upon way to rank uh, people along these racial categories, as we see with examples from Brazil, right? That's one example um, from South Asia. We see ways that race has taken shape in, in different forms, but in many ways that global hierarchy does still hold. And we think about people like Charles, Charles Mills, who recently transitioned from this earth, but one of the uh, great thinkers in terms of race and philosophy. And he has this uh, text, the, the racial contract. And in it talks about those racialized as white and those racialized as non-white. And so for him, that is the bigger question is uh, what does it look like for people who are white and then people who are not white. Uh, and then also uh, you also have, um, what it means to be white and black as it changes in local context. And so one chapter of my book, the one that's getting at the ways that Roma and Egyptians have been racialized is that in Albania, that term black is what the term that's used, right? But what does it mean for Roman Egyptians to assert a type of blackness in relationship to more of an African diasporic blackness? In a similar way, how are Albanians racialized as white, but then in other contexts racialized outside of whiteness? What Charles Mills would talk to talked about in terms of an off whiteness. And so we see this playing out globally too, right? Another text that's uh, pretty, that, that's really key is you know how the Jews became white folks, right? That's another um, popular ethnography and thinking about how do whiteness and blackness shift over time and across space? This is an excellent question. Yeah, uh, Cubans mark that by using the term blanco cubano or Cuban white. And the emphasis on the Cubanness is to mark what exactly what you're describing, a different context, of course, the not quite white, right? They're marking a dubiousness of their own category. I and mean, that's a category, that's a description often. Cuban whites used for themselves, Blanco Cubano. Well, maybe my great grandmother so and so was was not completely white. So it's a very similar idea of the slipperiness and the contextual contextuality of the categories, um, different categories, different context. Um, we have lots more questions. Gosh. Um, I think uh, I think a couple of them could be combined, and so. I, wanna, uh, if you, you want, yeah. <laughs> pick one, please. Yeah, I, I could try to maybe think about um, 
think about this too. Um, and uh, let's see, okay, I'm trying to think. Uh, okay, so I think I can combine these questions. Um, so I see that uh, Naida Greku and uh, Tiffany Floraville um, have, have asked questions that I think I could put together maybe um, because they're both about Roma and Egyptians. And so um, Naida um, has a very, a very good question here about racialization in terms of employment under communism in Albania and what that looked like for Roma uh, and Egyptians. And so in, in many ways, uh, under communism, and again, it, this varied by region, but um, so education, formal education was compulsory for most people. And so people, uh, most people had to complete school until uh, year eight, uh, the eighth grade, right? And so what happened though, is that you had a lot of Roman Egyptians who didn't necessarily complete school beyond that year. So just like you had many Albanians as well, uh, who then would go and work um, in a collective, right? Who would go and have a job, uh, but you still also had some jobs that many Roman Egyptians occupied, especially around cleaning uh, and, and waste removal, um, street cleaning, for example. And so we actually still see that today. And so many of the night crews that work for the um, the local, the municipality's trash company, for example, uh, many people who do a lot of the street cleaning are often Roma and Egyptians. And we see some of that historical shaping, but also what's happened in the period following 1991 is that we see even more Roman Egyptians not having access to jobs. And so where people have been relegated to this realm only if they are employed. Um, you also too see a lot higher percentages of unemployment that did not exist under the Hoxha regime. And so that's a, uh, that's a really good question. And I think it ties to um, Dr. Florabelle to Tiffany's question about the cross-ethnic solidarities. Um, and so, yes, there are efforts to forge um, solid ethnic solidarities with Roma across Europe. Um, and actually, Nida could speak to this, um, but uh, particularly across the Balkans, but then also across Europe itself. Um, but the ways that Blackness operates is not necessarily the same. And so the ways that Roma and Egyptians uh, assert a type of Blackness in Albania, A, is also not uniform throughout Albania. So I'm also talking about Tirana and, and what happens in cities, but it doesn't necessarily happen that same way throughout the country. But then also, too, um, there are some Black diasporic movements in solidarity, uh, especially when Roma from Albania travel outside of Albania into the West and forming relationships. But there are also Roman Egyptians who reject the uh, category of race, especially the, I'm sorry, the category of Black, right? Especially those outside of Albania who don't necessarily see identification in that way. And so um, we don't necessarily see that play out the exact same way. And one thing I'm trying to get at in my book is what are the unique aspects of the Albanian experience that might shape this and why? Um, here's a, a great question from Tatiana Rabinovich. Um, Dear Dr. Westohari, please, uh, thank you for your presentation. Could you please speak more about racial intimacies? How do you understand or define intimacies in the book and what work does the concept do for you? Thank you so much, that's a, a fantastic question. When I talk about racial intimacies, I'm, I'm thinking about what happens in relationships across the, what, we, what we see as these uh, racial groups, right? And so very often, uh, for example, uh, thinking about just race as a category, uh, people often think about the distinct groups and the ways that um, th these group dynamics and how there aren't relationships across racial groups. Um, and so I'm, I'm a arguing that that's not necessarily how um, to approach Albania, that um, even though we have a lot of racialization or there's a lot of racialization going on and people are racialized in various ways, um, the ways that uh, people have relationships uh, between Roma, Egyptians, and Albanians creates a unique intimacy for some people. And so that one example that I gave about 
um, Albanians, especially from the north and their relationship to Roman Egyptians in Tirana and how their neighborhoods get situated is one example of that intimacy. Another other examples though, too, I want to also add that. So Egyptians don't consider themselves to be Roma, that they assert a different type of identity with an Egyptian heritage and they don't speak the Romani language. Even though Egyptians are often included in this um, kind of Roma umbrella category. But that's also really key because because in fact, even though in the neighborhood where I did a lot of research in Shkos, you had Roman Egyptian families present and you had even those who were inter intermarried and a particular type of intimacy there. In fact, though, you will see a lot of Egyptians distance themselves from Roma and vice versa. And so even within this category of Black, um, those racialized as Black, I'm also trying to get at um, where those intimacies are present, where we see this type, these close intimates, these forms of attachment between those racialized as Black, and then where we see the divergence, um, where we see the ways that Albanians might talk about Roma and Egyptians as different people. Another example too comes from um, those who might beg in the streets and the ways that some Albanians might consider that to be a practice for Roma, right? And not Egyptians. And the Egyptians are thought to maybe be in a different class a, a socioeconomic class above Roma, um, but how often, in fact, there is a, a very a lot of ambiguous ways that Roma and Egyptians both occupy spaces um, in the street um, in terms of begging, but the ways that Albanians might might shape that differently in terms of how they understand race, how they understand blackness. So I hope that gets at that um, at that question. Um, but I'd be happy to talk more about that. Um. I want to go back. We, I think we've sort of scrolling back and forth here to try to get at all, all the questions. There's, there's another one here from Lori. Um, as a follow-up to the television show story that you told, I, I think I saw that there was an emphatic denial of the idea that Albanians could be racist. But I do not remember if there was any understanding on the part of the TV show hosts about whiteness as a construction or his identification with whiteness. What do you remember about that? Yes, excellent question. So there wasn't uh, a lot of discussion about whiteness and who was white or rather, you know, or, or there wasn't any type of adamant, um, you know, kind of like an adamant, um, I'm trying to say, um, suggestion that Albanians were white, but more, much of the conversation did focus on this question about races, race, who could be racist. And in fact, the segment of the show where we got in depth was called racism or ignorance and really focusing on, you know, is something really racist or are people being ignorant or what some people would call like a mild racism, right? So when I would talk about an example in which I was on a plane to Albania once and um, an Albanian woman got on the plane and was just like, wow, look, look, it's an N word, right? And she kept repeating it over and over again, but she was also um, almost petting me, right? Like very just, you know, looking at me and just so astonished to see me. And so I shared that example in terms of like a racial encounter. And immediately the show was like, no, no, that's clean racism is what they said, right? So there was a lot of denial about racism and the ways they understood, you know, an Albanian response to me, even though we can't, we have a generalized response, but that's, that was a lot of discussion. And then there was also discussion about the racism that Albanians have experienced and a lot of emphasis on how racist Greek people are. But that type of articulation around whiteness was not as uh, was not as present as much. Now that was 2013. I will say in my uh, follow up research that I most recently conducted in 2018, um, there was much more discussion among people about Albanians in terms of whiteness, in terms of Europeanness, that was not present in 2013. I think a lot of factors shape that, uh, particularly Albania's relationship to the European Union. Um, there was much more global conversation about race and whiteness at that time too, especially as, um, as shaped by the 2016 election in the United States uh, of Donald Trump and the ways that people began to talk more globally about whiteness, about white nationalism, for example. And so I think too, even in that short period of five or six years, about five years, we, that you, you could see some of the differences. And so I'm also um, very curious on my next time to do ethnographic research, how that's changed even more now in 2021. Okay, terrific. Um, let's, see, let's see if we have any other questions here. 
Um, I saw one from uh, Nita Lucy um, that um, was thinking about um, the you know, recent rediscovery of Du Bois and American sociology. Oh, I, um, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so, oh, yeah. you know, yeah, I, and that's a great question. Thank you, Anita. I think that um, that uh, some of his theory, particularly around a double consciousness, um, you know, could be something that might travel to the Albanian and larger region. And so I also, I would want to be, you know, careful about that and particularly thinking about about Du Bois's work in terms of um, in terms of of blackness, right? In a particular place that it, or that he was writing about, and 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 the and the relationship between blackness and whiteness as shaped by the United States. But I do think that people um, that's the reading of his work, um, w- you know, would have a response in the Balkan region, especially when we think about. Uh, race and religion um, in particular. And also to go back to Charles Mills's notion of what it means to be off white, right? So not quite white. I do think I, that there, um, I could see the, that reading there. Also though, Du Bois was a scholar of whiteness, right? And particularly some of uh, his later work really got at questions around whiteness that I, um, that I do see people applying more um, today or, or, or kind of applying in a, in a new way. And I do think that some of that work and reading of his work might travel to the broader Balkan region. I think that scholars right now are, are engaging more questions about whiteness uh, in the Balkan context and how uh, Du Bois's work uh, could be relevant for that. And then finally, along those lines, too, I'm thinking about Du Bois, it got me thinking too as well about just Black scholars and thinkers, particularly of the early 20th century, who um, either wrote about or traveled to the former Soviet Union and other um, spaces that would later become communist states. And this is not my primary area of research, but I do think that there's a ways that those writings and, uh, and some of that work could uh, travel more and be relevant to the region and really ask questions that um, like Catherine Baker addresses in her book on race in the former Yugoslavia of, of what it means to you know be a part of the non-aligned movement for example um, of, um, and, and what it means to have a communist state think about that in Eastern Europe and ha- and how that is uh, how that how that situates those people who are part of these communist states, uh, along lines of whiteness and blackness and what that looks like in today's, um, in, to, in, in the contemporary moment. And so I do think there is a lot of relevance there for some of that work. Um, we have another question I think you've sort of just touched on, but not explicitly. And it, uh, I'm going to summarize here. This is from Elidor Mehiwi. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing some of these names. Um, that... Um, you rightly noted your work is focused on Albanians in Albania, and so I hesitate to push you outside of the country where your ethnographic work was conducted, but did you get any responses that may have made references, for example, to how Albanians have been racialized in the former Yugoslavia? Yes, and I think that's a a fantastic question, and so while I haven't conducted a significant amount of research um, in the former Yugoslavia, I have conducted some ethnographic research in Kosovo, for example. Um, Now, some of that was uh, with um, Egyptians and then also those uh, considered Ashkali, right? So I was trying to get at these questions around blackness and um, in Kosovo, but also with uh, with Kosovar Albanians and in their particular relationship to Serbians. Um, I also uh, have uh, in, in that, um, chapter where I'm going to talk about um, the Albania-Serbia football match that ended with the brawl. Um, I'm going to talk about that as well as most rec- the most recent World Cup um, and, and the ways that the relationship between Albanians and Serbians is shaped by the, uh, the ways that Albanians have been racialized in the former Yugoslavia, right? And so how Albanian itself has this transnational component and, and, and what that looks like um, when, it's, uh, when Albanians are racialized in opposition to Serbians. And so while I don't speak as specifically to the former Yugoslavia itself, uh, I do engage quite a bit this category of Albanians and what that looks like in Kosovo, for example, as well as in Macedonia and how often Albanians are othered with 
um, with Turkish communities, right? That's how this plays out in Skopje as one example, um, and other as different, you know, than Macedonians, right? Than those who are Slavic. Uh, and so again, you're right. That's not exactly my particular area, but those th that type of work is is also built into this question about um, Albanians and not just Albanians within the present day. Uh, nation state. I also too, um, when I'm getting into the section around, you know, race, ethnicity, and these ancient ethnic, uh, ancient ethnic hatreds, I also get into this question as well, because when we're talking about Albanians and we're talking about Serbians, for example, in the broader Balkan context and the, the long history, which I know you're familiar, um, Elidor, uh, I, that's also really key, right? And so some people laugh when I say, oh yeah, but you know, references to the year 1389, for example, are still key for my book as an anthropologist in 2021. Um, but, you know, but but the the kind of currency that those conversations um have and the frequency with which people talk about this long history is also really key for delving into this question of how race operates um, and how people talk about ancient ethnic hatreds, but also to the ways that in the present day, often the Balkans is, is um, thought of as like unable to escape those ancient ethnic hatreds. And, and the Formiga Savi is a great example for, for how that plays out. You have time for one more question, Chelsea. I think, yeah, sure, sure. Okay, because I just saw there are a few questions that came up in the chat, not in the Q&A. And there's some, a couple of them overlap. I apologize to anyone that we're going to skip. Hopefully your question has been substantively answered already. But there is one question here that um, is terrific and, and we haven't touched on, you haven't touched on at yet. And it goes like this. Could, um, thank you so much for this amazing talk, Dr. Ohari. Could you comment on how race intersects with gender in Albania? The narrative I've heard is that traditionally Albanian society was highly patriarchal, but that during the communist period, the ideological emphasis on gender equality further furthered women's rights in the country. However, I imagine that today this is not the case across all class or racial groups. Stereotypes of Romani women getting married very early or having many children, etc. And this yes. is from Milena from your class in 2020. Yes, my former student. Hi, Milena. Thank you for that question. That's a really excellent question. And so I'll try to quickly give a, give a quick response, but it's obviously a question that we could talk about at length. And so, uh, so yes, um, Albanian society is highly patriarchal, uh, still is. And, um, but I also want to make a distinction because very often, again, Albania and other countries in the Balkan region uh, will get othered or framed as um, you know, highly patriarchal um, and, and in terms of in relationship to the West, for example, where there is thought often to be not as patriarchal, but um, the ways that these patriarchal practices manifest and take shape are just different across spaces. So I also want to make that point known that um, in terms of how we you know, understand these high, um, highly patriarchal societies. But yes, that is the case. There was an emphasis on gender inequality um, and you know that was furthered during the communist regime, but especially the ways that women um, still experience a lot of, um, of intimate violence, right? Especially thinking about within the home and the ways too that um, that there were still performances of patriarchy or patriarchal practices, the positioning of men in relationship to women that still existed, even though, yes, you had women in uh, who were learning formally in schools who previously were not, um, as well as women um, in the workplace uh, when previously many women would just would be at home, right, um, and uh, would be kind of relegated to the domestic sphere. So you did have that happen. Um, however, um, in the uh, so to, is that the same across all class and and racial groups? So um, though there was an attempt to make that um, kind of equal throughout the country and across different groups, um, it, what you find though, especially relating to Roma communities, is that um, there was uh, there were practices in which Roma women got married earlier and younger, not necessarily though that much earlier than Albanian women. It was still common for Albanian women, for example, to get married at 17 or at 18, um, especially um, in, in certain villages. And that, and, and so even though you do have Roma women who get married at let's say 14, um, that wasn't, it, it wasn't necessarily thought of as that much earlier. Um, and, and so when we talk about the period now in 1991, 
that yes, there are practices in which people do marry younger in Roma communities, um, but, uh, but the ways that that happens are not necessarily the, as represented by the media, right? Or as represented by NGOs, particularly those that claim that want to you know, emancipate or save women, but in fact have not really grappled with the dynamics that shape uh, marriages, that shape early marriage for young women, but also address issues of class, right? And the ways that marriage um, for some people becomes a way to, um, to, to kind of climb the socioeconomic ladder. That being said though, that, um, that particularly domestic violence and violence against women is a major problem in Albania. And that's um, not just uh, with Albanian groups, but also with Roma and Egyptian communities. And, that, and, and some might say that that's only increased in the period since 1991. Um, and, and so um, they're actually currently a couple of really recent articles written about this, uh, about gender violence, as well as now resistance and formations and people responding to this increasing gender violence and really demanding that the state uh, address this uh, because it's very high, very alarming numbers um, and the ways too that women are often not seen um, as fully human and what that looks like in everyday practices. So essentially I'm giving you a very complex answer to the question, um, but to say that yes, that intersection of looking at race and looking at race and gender is really key. I want to say finally that going back to racial intimacies, you will also too often find relationships between let's say Roman Egyptian women and Albanian women in neighborhoods and in settings where they might they might collectively either work together or meet together um, or have a, a type of relationship across those, you know, these social racial lines. And so we see the ways that gender might shape a type of positioning, particularly for women, um, that we may not necessarily see between, let's say, Roma, Egyptian, and Albanian men. Thank you so much. That is a, that's a great answer. And I'm afraid we are out of time. There are a couple more questions. I will, um, I will email them to you because I feel like we really are out of time, unfortunately. And you may be interested to hear uh, some more. There's a, another great question about uh, feminism and the women's movement. So I, I'll yes. get to that at least through email. Um, I always hate the way that uh, online presentations just to end with a, more with a whimper than a bang. Um, they, when we all just click the off button. Um, but I really, and I also wish that the audience was here live to applaud really, or to thank you more effusively than I can just do by myself. Lovely presentation, wonderful work, really um, stimulating in a global sense, uh, really um, all ethnography, if we have anything to contribute as ethnographers, it is to a comparative understanding of the world beyond our own research sites. And I think you've done that just wonderfully here today. Thank you so much. Uh, good luck with the writing of your book. And folks, um, please keep track of Dr. Restohori's work. Um, and I just want to add, thank you so much for that, Paul, um, that you all will be receiving a follow up, um, a link, a follow up link after this talk. And so um, it will include my contact information. And so for those of you who had questions that we were not able to ask them, or I didn't address them, please feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to discuss the research project further. Terrific. All right. Thank, thank you. you. And remember, in two weeks, we have another colloquium presentation, Benjamin Young talking about working class families in Brazil. Thank you, Dr. West uh, Ahori, and thank you everyone for attending. Thank Goodbye. you. Goodbye.